and uh, my name's John Wright. I write books. Um, I was a thir uh, for 30 years. I was a furniture maker as well. So wood has uh, 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 sort of taken over my life. Trees have, because uh, I'm also interested in fungi, and uh, it is mostly fungi. Well, oh, have I got the clicker? Does it work? Yeah. <laughs> this is where it can all fall, yeah. f fall flat again. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Other, I can actually talk for about half an hour on the slide you have in front of you. Uh, is any, I, I am, um, uh, I mean, this, uh, we've had some very serious discussion in the first half. I am a relentlessly cheerful and optimistic person. I hope this comes through. Um, I'm going to talk about rot. I'm not going to talk rot. Uh, I'm going to talk about rot. Uh, and, also, and also, I hope to do what uh, Richard mentioned earlier, which is be, a, be an, an evangel evangelist. I'm going to uh, sort of try to convince you there's lots of interesting things in the countryside which you will pass by, not just in the countryside, in towns as well. Um, is anybody excited about the slide you, uh, you can see there? Yes, good. Well done. <laughs> I Do you was, want the next one? Uh, oh, no, no, I don't want this. I'm going to talk about this one for 10 minutes, yeah. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is rot in its very late stage. And what you can see is uh, the remains of not exactly a tree, but what you have left after a tree, in this case a beech tree, and mostly it is beech trees that have these things. Uh, I shall tell you the story right from the beginning. Fungi will, uh, will take over wood. Uh, they'll take over a tree, maybe still living. They will live there. There'll be a saprotroph. They will gradually kill the tree, and, uh, and, the, and the tree dies. Now, there will be multiple colonies of fungi within a single trunk of beech, say. Uh, fungi do not get on well with each other, uh, even in the same species. Uh, and uh, so they do what we all do when we are frightened of our next door neighbours. They put up walls and they encapsulate themselves. So the mycelium of the fungus infects the wood and, uh, and then it doesn't get on with its neighbours, so it puts up a wall. And these are called, wait for it, pseudosclerotial plates. See how exciting this is. <laughs> Um, has anybody ever been to a country show or a craft uh, exhibition where there's a wood turner there? And, uh, and you can see... <laughs> was that a yes or a no? I'm not sure. <laughs> and I've, I've done this myself. I actually turn stuff out of something called sported beach. Uh, and the beach has been infected by the, the fungus, cut down before the fungus can destroy it, and then uh, turned into uh, timber that can be uh, used, usually for hideous little vases that go on people's mantelpieces, <laughs> or, uh, and so on. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, she, some of you have had that experience, didn't uh, <laughs> Did your nephew buy it for you? Yes, that's usually what happens. Um, uh, if, uh, that, that, that's when it's still useful. The wood is slightly weakened, but uh, uh, the, the, what happens is the pseudosclerotial plate, because they are designed, oh, there's another one. Um, uh, this would explain, this is the same thing, uh, but it's encapsulating one that's been left on the floor all on its own. I'll go back. I'm much, I'm, <laughs> that's much better, that one. I like that one. <laughs> and... Uh, I, I, was thrilled to, I was thrilled to find this because this is the last stage. Because they are there to defend fungi, uh, defend against fungi, they persist and the wood rots completely. No fungus can attack that. Eventually it breaks down, uh, uh, probably through bacterial action. This is the last stage of decomposition apart from total collapse. And uh, I was so thrilled to get that picture and I'm Glad you enjoyed it too. Uh, this is one. Uh, this explains why so much wood on the forest floor is black, especially in beech woods. Um, I don't know what the next slide is, um, or indeed any of the other slides I've got. Um, they will come as as much a surprise to me as they do to you. So, uh, oh, this is lovely. I, we won't get very far. 
Uh, my friend Brian Edwards, who's one of those very annoying people who knows absolutely everything. I like to think of myself as a, a reasonably uh, competent general naturalist. Uh, I'm probably slightly better than competent uh, field mycologist. I'm not a professional mycologist. Uh, but Brian, uh, he knows absolutely everything, and uh, it's extremely annoying. He took me to see this tree uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, it's actually, in, I think it's another beach. And um, it's not in great condition, but th this is how I like to see trees. Not if I'm making furniture, uh, but this is how I love to see trees. It's diseased, it's twisted. It has 26 species of lichen on it. Uh, this is about as much as you get in, a, in, in a half a square mile of London. We've only got it's only about 120 species of lichen have survived the, uh, survived the 1940s, 50s. Um, uh, uh, so this is an amazing ecosystem. Uh, I, I think the part of my evang evangelism here is to show you that even on a single tree, even on a sort of pile of rubbish that you see in the woods, there is so much to see. We see uh, on the television, peop uh, you know, people are always saying how, uh, how things are being destroyed, and this is true. Uh, we are losing species, perhaps not as many as are suggested. There are constant problems, but we don't see what is there already. Um, let's see. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Does anybody know what that is? Uh, this is a, a Creolophus serratus. It's the, uh, the cloud fungus. It's that big. It's that big. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's one of the most, uh, sorry, it's a Herisium uh, serratum. Uh, and um, it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And I found, I've seen it three times before. This is the most perfect one I've ever seen. I found that in 1921. Uh, if anybody knows... <laughs> 2021, yeah. <laughs> We're from the last century. <laughs> Richard and I are very much last century, I'm afraid. Um, uh, it's rotting, it's a rotting tree. Um, I, I also show people other things. Um, I take people on mushroom forays. I've done about 1,200 mushroom wild food forays over the years, maybe taken 15,000 people out, and if it's a mushroom foray, often people will come up and show me a leaf that looks like that. Say, John, is this a fungus? I say, no, that is, uh, that is a gall. It's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's called the um, sp uh, spangle gall. Uh, there's several spangle galls, and I tell them its story. This is made by the plant under the instructions of the egg and subsequent larvae of, uh, generally speaking, it's a wasp, sometimes it's a mite, sometimes it's a fungus, sometimes it's a nematode worm, sometimes it's bacteria. Most of them are insects, most of them are wasps. Um, and it will actually change the expression of DNA. It will actually transfer a little bit of plasmids into the plant material. Also produce hormones which stimulate growth and it will form basically a fort fortified dining room for the grub. This is a common species. You'll see this if you start looking underneath oak leaves. You will see these in London as well. I promise you, you will see them. Um, there's more to it. These um, uh, these galls, they, they are the homes of these grubs, the parasitic wasps. Uh, they, in turn, they, they may carry passengers. Uh, some other insect or grub will get in there, so it will share the home. Some of them are parasites, so you get parasites growing on parasites, and you get the parasitoids, and these are parasites that feed off the parasites. Of their par you get where I'm going on that. There's so much intricacy here, and it, it's just in such a small space. Uh, tell me when to stop. Keep I'll just... Go, keep going, yeah. and then we'll chat right. to you guys. <laughs> two more minutes. Uh, two more minutes. Uh, uh, th I mean, this is a rot, a rot fungus. It's growing on wood. It's rotting. It's a, it's a Mycena. It used to be Mycena. Uh, let's go for Mycena rorida. Uh, rorida is a, a, a reference to river, and it's the glutinous stem. I, I was very pleased to see this. Not particularly uncommon, but you see it very seldom. Um, it has the unusual property of glowing in the dark. Incidentally, um, it's not edible. I, je I tend to not eat things that glow in the dark, so uh, don't you do that. <laughs> I don't think we've got much more. Yes, this is, uh, this is a, a, another fungus. This is not a rot fungus, so uh, I'm a little bit off topic here. Uh, but uh, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> uh, would anybody eat that? Would anybody eat that? Uh, that is called the uh, uh, the fool's web cap, and um, 
that's enough to, to finish off uh, four or five of you. It's a really nasty one. I was thrilled to bits with this one, particularly because I, <laughs> I, I very seldom uh, uh, see it. Um, I think that's my last slide. I didn't do very many, did I? I would, I, I would say, uh, go out, look around you, look, walk across London. I just, uh, sorry, shameless plug, new book out in May, uh, and, and it was a series of walks my wife and I did, and one of them was from Fulham, where my grandfather was born, uh, to Marble Arch, where he, uh, where he met my grandmother. Uh, uh, he was a Coldstream Guardsman uh, just after the First World War. Um, actually, I think my grandmother accosted him because he, he was a very shy man and she was not a shy lady. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, we do, and the whole point of this, uh, of this book is to describe what we see on the way. And we found loads of stuff between Fulham and Marble Arch. So it's there for you. Uh, if you want wild food, I found wild rocket in Haringey. I found sea beet in Dagenham. I could go on and on, and that's enough for me. Get out there and have a look. Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> Your, um, summary of the, the previous session, you're using the term e evangelizing, and I kind of came to this talk not in, a, in the mode of evangelizing, but in the mode of confusion. And I wanted to talk about this particular term that Judith used in her charming introduction, and Loretta also used, which is um, ecosystem services, which is a kind of slightly slippery, intriguing, and mildly repulsive term, I think. And I wanted to apply it to kind of some of the trees I know to see if I could try and get to grips what it actually means. So. Um, ecosystems, as I kind of understand what that is in, in a conceptual way, not in any sort of academic way. It refers to things that are dynamic, immense, chaotic, and kind of quite hard to define. But the services bit feels much more easy to define. It's kind of stuff like delivery and having a cleaner, isn't it? It's like when someone does stuff for you. And so when we're designing often in the public realm, we kind of apply that services bit as a measurement to justify why we should have trees. It's about the stuff that trees do for us. And so there's this description that if you have, I think it's 12% more canopy cover in a street, you can reduce crime. You can increase the value of streets with street trees by up to 5 to 18%. Um, you can increase footfall and therefore the economic revenue of shopping centres by planting trees. So all of these things are kind of an evidence that are used with developers to persuade them to make that spend on trees. So the service, the ecosystem services, that slippery repulsive term. Okay, so the, 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 the services bit is kind of easy to understand, but then I kind of was thinking like if the service is a transaction, that's what the tree does for us, then what is it that we do for the tree? Or is it that we don't have a transaction with the tree, but it's the tree that's the transactional object? Is, that, is the tree becomes the thing that we commodify? And so kind of we know that commodifying nature never really goes well for nature in a neoliberal free market. Um, so this is an inventory of compromised trees in a square kilometer of wood green. And they range, range in age from kind of quite young, probably about five to ten years old, to several hundred years old. And when I was kind of making this walk and collecting this, this evidence of these trees that are being suffocated by the tarmac, I was wondering how old they were. And the extraordinary thing is, is that I couldn't find any way of finding out how long a London plane lives, because evidence seems to say that none of them have died from natural causes. So trees known to have been planted in Parkland in 1680 are still alive. However, trees in Parkland have very different conditions to urban trees. Trees not only draw um, water up through their roots, but they also breathe through their roots. And in the city, this encroaching, impermeable crust that they're being suffocated with is slowly killing them. And the more mature a tree, the older it is, the bigger its canopy is. And it's the canopy that brings the greatest benefits to the urban environment. And yet, even though we know we have these assets, planning um, and policy tends to focus on the new rather than the retrofit and care for these existing assets. So it seems like that idea of the 
kind of quantifying the services of trees only works when you're projecting forwards. It doesn't work when you're looking back at what you've already got. Um, and so this is a project where we explored what it takes to kind of uh, release a tree from the trauma of being trapped in the tarmac. It's a project with Robert Bray Associates, and it's making um, a suds landscape in White Hart Lane. Um, the, the kind of um, approach that we took was to think of the tree not as a transactional object, but conceive the design process as the transaction, asking what conditions does the tree need to thrive. And once the tree thrives, then the services thrive. And the conditions for the tree can also make conditions of well-being for people, which is that sort of way that people tend to quantify those services. But that should, that should follow what we do for the tree rather than lead it. So this image, so that's a detail from the same scheme. Um, and this image, if it's visible, which it, oh yeah. This image shows the, um, on the, on the bottom slides, shows how we took space away from the car and gave it back to people and nature. So the road is what's called hung, so it tilts down um, from the north to the south and drains all the rainwater that falls on the impermeable landscape into the permeable landscape and through the rain garden where the pollution that's um, produced by the cars on the road is then eaten by the microbes in the soil of the rain garden and the water then percolates through and is hydraulically linked to the roots of that mature tree. So completely um, radically altering um, the environment that that tree was living in. And the first season after this scheme was um, implemented, we went back to have a look at it. And we know London Plains have that kind of snaky skin, and it had shed all of its bark onto the road. And we kind of thought that's really peculiar. But apparently, that's something that trees do when they're either in a really stressful situation or after they've been in a stressful situation. And it kind of felt like the tree was just making this big sigh and kind of... Um, relaxing into its new environment. Um, so this project was also very much about water and the kind of impact that um, the mismanagement of having impermeable surfaces has on those ecosystems um, in the city. And this is um, an interpretation board we made for another project which describes how um, when you don't have a permeable surface and you don't let the earth act like a sponge, you don't let that e ecosystem act naturally, um, the water washes all the pollution off the road into, into the management system that we have, which then in storm situations with climate emergency um, becomes overwhelmed. And all of those pollutions are just washed straight into rivers with devastating consequences for wildlife. So the, the, kind of the premise of this scheme was to, to, to clean that water, um, make it... Um, the sponge for the trees and then to release it slowly back into watercourses where it wouldn't devastate the ecosystems. And this is another scheme that shows um, that kind of process. All of that surface is permeable and there's a below ground um, modulation which directs all the water that falls onto the pavement into the planting beds. And so I think this, this kind of way of thinking about design as the uh, kind of process of making that relationship with the tree is all about what happens below ground much more than what happens above ground. And yet those designs still do, do make places of well-being and places of play and places of repose for people. They just do it in a way that prioritizes the tree rather than people. And so just to keep going on that idea of um, the give and take, or the take, there is a tendency for architects to have expectations of trees, um, to elevate them into the sky. Um, in a sense, it's a self-deception as much as a deception, this idea that you aren't taking up ground. You're just, it's just this act of elevation. And I suppose I was just going to pick up this, that idea of you know, what do trees do? And the notion of performing and performance, which is appropriate enough given that we're sitting on a stage together. But it's interesting, if you take the architect away from search engine and you just look for trees on roofs, they look, tend to look more like this. <laughs> and, and that idea of, you know, what, what does a tree need 
and the need to make space for trees and that if you want them to remain elevated to make space for backstage in order that, or below ground for, in order them, for them to perform is a tension for architects because they're not there to design tree rooms. They're there to place buildings in cities. And I think I'm going to start with a very recent project. So this is a collaboration. There's a lot of we in the work of MUFF, not just the members of MUFF who are here today, including some people who used to work, colleagues who used to work with us, but also those we collaborate, so not just Robert Bray, but um, Joe Gibbons of JNL Gibbons. We learned and moved so much. This is the last most recent project we did with JNL Gibbons, Tau Court, working with Adam Kahn Architects. And here we started, the first thing we did was survey the trees and draw the root zones and then see what space was left for the buildings. This means that the buildings themselves had to rearrange themselves, orthogonal geometries had to shift um, to make space for the roots, and, um, and it created a veil uh, for, the, for the buildings, but we also then introduced new trees that themselves created privacy and aspect in what was um, a dense scheme. So going back to an early project, 12 years earlier, embarking, the buildings did not inflect. Rather, this commission to Muff was to make a square. The square ended up being T-shaped, two intersecting rooms connected by stage. The first paved with its folly at the end. The second was dark. That big eight-story building cast the space into shadow and the brief to make somewhere vibrant and place to sit in the sun was challenged. And our move was to fill it with trees, to fill it with an arboretum of mature trees with the idea that to make a place that's even more shady and to make space for reverie and for escape um, was appropriate, especially in a place of such um, overcrowding. And so here, um, you know, we weren't entirely honorable because the trees were performing for us. Um, they were backdrop to everyday life, uh, cherry trees behind the stage, but equally everyday life protects the tree. So those very large areas of ground are edged by benches. And here I, I wish I had a slide for your book, excellent book, which is coming out. Um, it's called the Observant Walker, John Wright, that's his book. But this is um, just a call out for Joanna Gibbons and her book of interviews um, around that idea of urban forest, that tree by tree, we can put the forest back into I'll London. That. I'll give you that tenor later. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, and so I'm just going to move quickly to Hackney Wick in East London a commission just before the Olympics to attempt to make some small legacies for the neighborhoods and communities around it. There was no public realm because it had been built as an industrial area. Public realm and shared spaces had to be claimed back first by from the car. And there again, a tree performed for us. The tree became its own placard, permission, taking up ground. This began with a very large hole and a hole big enough for that, um, that <coughs> trunk to grow um, as, as a, both an invitation, and I think going back to Clarissa's point, you know, marking um, space, space for people as well as planting, and forming um, a focus for um, play to happen around it. In Ruskin Square, we somehow succeeded to do both, making space for the tree. This is a privately owned public space where we were able to persuade the developer to start with this public space and build the building second. There was, oh, it, the site had been cleared. There was just one horse chestnut. You can read in that book the effort to keep one tree alive whilst building happened around it. And so space is made for the trees, but the trees make a space, an oval space, um, a drawing room, mark it a mark for um, John Ruskin. But the trees are connected below ground, as um, Catherine described earlier. Um, this is a wonky tree bought from the very edge of the plantation. So what are your sorts of trees? Um, 
and yet and smoke comes out of the forest. It just happens to be vaping smell of smoke rather than the smoke of managed forests. And just to um, end with a project under construction that generated a lot of discussion on the Moth Instagram account, um, where seven trees have existed in a small patch of gra grass since it's thought the 14th century, definitely for 500 years, seven trees which were replanted by seven sisters, each planting a tree. As the trees have died, they've been replaced, and now there are seven hornbeams, each planted by one seven sisters. And here, um, the mark we're making is to <coughs> mark those trees as important with, with a ring of stone with the idea that a piece of ground where nobody sits on the ground can be a place to get, to get close to trees. And one day, all tube stations will be called after Seven Sisters, just like Seven Sisters. Thank you very much. Mm. <laughs> we'll have to whip them on. Yeah. Thank you, excellent yeah. timekeeping. Nice. Super yeah. well done, yeah. thank you. <laughs> I think I want to move on to Russell now because I think that works really well with what John and Lisa and Catherine have talking about. So Russell is probably the person in the room that knows most about trees from any, any of us. So Russell has been teaching me um, pruning fruit trees and that's not something you turn up and wear a high vis and take pictures and um, post on Instagram and then go away, but it's something that needs to happen every year again and needs to be considered um, really carefully in terms of its um, spatial dimensions and in terms of thinking what happened the year before and what will happen if I'm doing this cut or this cut. And so it's a really interesting um, activity that takes time and is slow and needs sort of a contingent of people that coming again and again. And Russell somehow is this very quiet, very modest person who manages to get um, these kind of groups of people together. So he's, he started, for example, the Tree Musketeers and is sort of running a lot of schemes around um, Hackney. And when we were talking about, about this talk, he sort of, or in some of the, the walks that he gives, he talks about how he feels he needs to make um, a certain amount of enemies to be useful. And also that he feels he, that he almost, that you need to be invisible to, um, to bring about change. And I think I would love you to talk more about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you hear me? So uh, it was really interesting when you, you, you pulled me up on the fact that I'd said I'd made enough enemies, and like, what did that mean? And it forced me to think about it. And the truth is we live in an anti-nature culture, a culture which actively destroys nature. And so if you're going to champion nature and you're going to protect nature, you're going to make enemies. And those enemies won't necessarily be discernible before you start, because the enemy might be the council, it might be your neighbor. It might be corporate business. It might even be the state. And what I, I'm, I'm, I'm meaning when I talk about making enough enemies is that if you're going to make positive change, you will upset some people. And upsetting those people isn't necessarily a bad thing. It may, in fact, be a necessary thing. Which isn't to say, make as many enemies as you can, because obviously there are downsides to making enemies. But that's what it means. And it's just, it's literally experience. It's just, you know, I do stuff, people kick back, and I say, well, it makes sense. Um, we argue about it. Um, and I mean, I think it's really interesting being, being on the stage with so many brilliant people and how we're all struggling, all fighting to make space for trees, to make space for nature, to celebrate nature, to connect people with nature in a culture which is deliberately hostile to nature and those who care about it. Um, so the point about invisibility is that essentially the culture will reward that which it wants. And what it wants is ego. What it wants is domination. What it wants is power. What it wants is exploitation. And if you're about something other than that, then you have to expect that the culture <coughs> will not reward you. And so it's the whole you know, classic saying of think global, act local where you have to have a consciousness about the bigger picture, but at the same time, the only way in which you can really affect change is by acting very, very locally and creating as much love and positivity as you can in the environment available to you. Um, so that, that's where those comments come from. 
And is that how you get people to come back and help you year after year, no matter if it rains? Or yeah, I think that's right. So one of the big challenges with trees, um, we've seen multiple challenges, but one of the big challenges, particularly at the moment, is there's a fad for planting trees, and there's some kind of myth that somehow trees are going to save us. Um, it, partly because the fossil fuel industry doesn't want anyone talking about how much fossil fuel we're using, so let's plant trees and everything will be fine. No, it won't. Um, the figures for London are that the entire tree stock of London sequesters about 2% of the carbon used in London per annum. So if you doubled the tree cover in London, which you can't, you would sequester about 4% of the carbon used in London. So we've got to reduce using carbon. And though, so there's a, a backspin going on at the moment where there's a, there's a myth around planting trees. And one of the big struggles with planting trees is you can plant as many trees as you like, but how many of them are going to live? Do you put them in the right place? Do you use the right tree stock? Do you do some adequate aftercare? Do you give a damn whether or not your tree survives? You know, because is it, is it, I mean, I, I have a joke about how old is a development. You can tell how old a development is by how dead the trees are. If the trees are alive, then it's a new development. And you know, if, if half of them are dead, it's three years old. If most of them are dead, it's more than five years old. And you, know, you can try it, believe me, go out there and have a look. There are great projects which do it properly, but there are plenty that don't. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's a challenge to navigate the political um, uh, environment. And, and you know, this is me, this is bonkers. You know, there I am with my bike, carrying water on the back of the bike to go and water a couple of trees. And that's how micro it gets, you know, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're trying to get things to survive. Um, I mean, unfortunately, that tree probably shouldn't have been felled. That was a replacement tree for a, for a tree that had been dog damaged. And it looked pretty bad, the damage, but the tree would have survived. And you've got this other thing that come, kind of you're combating is the paranoia around tree safety. You're just about more likely to be killed by a tree than lightning but we don't do an awful lot about protecting ourselves from lightning. Um, and likewise, you're much more likely, 40 times more likely, to be injured by a wheelie bin than you are by a tree. And generally speaking, we don't concern ourselves too much about wheelie bins. So there's a, I, I mean, I do all sorts of things. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an ex-lawyer, I'm an ARB consultant, and I would love to get back into law and take some cases, uh, you know, to, to destroy the law on subsidence. The law on subsidence is utterly absurd. You've got buildings which were built, you know, many, many years ago on crap foundations. We've got clay soils, clay soils shrink, the building moves, it's the tree's fault. It's like, you know, that's just bonkers. You could fell every tree in London and the buildings are going to keep moving. The building isn't suitable for the foundations and climate change means that clay is going to keep drying out. But the insurance companies can, can play that game. So, you know... <laughs> and I could rant about many other issues such as tree risk, but, um, you know, there I am putting up an owl box and, and doing an ab, a, a tree walk in Abney. I mean, I, I love John's talk. What you've got to do is enthuse people about the natural world and do what we can on a small scale locally. Um, and th these are some of my tree planting for climate change photos because um, actually if you want your trees to survive, you've got to make the hole fit the tree and you've got to give the tree space for it to grow into and remove the turf. And that takes time, and nine times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100, that's not done, and that's why the trees die. But um, I'll shut up for now. Thank Brilliant. you. Brilliant. I think, I think that moves on really nicely to, to the story I wanted Tom and Richard to talk about, which is, I think Tom has been teaching at the ETH for a long time and he's been very well known for this amazing timber structure that he's been making with his students. And then something changed at one point where I think you were starting to make a garden and I wonder if you can tell us about the story with the garden and the digging and why it's important to teach architects not just about making buildings. Can I just explain where Tom teaches? Because ETH is another acronym everybody from knows. the Greek. Mm. Um, uh, ETH is in, how do you say it? Zurich. Zurich. It's in no, Zurich. there's a special way of pronouncing it. Eidgenossenschaft. Eidgenossenschaft Zurich. Um, Hochschule, <laughs> Technische Hochschule. Technische Hochschule, yeah. It means like some, something technical. like the Technical College of the Brotherhood mm -hmm. or something. Yes. And yeah. since like one strange. of the darknesses in the evening is where do things come from, um, 
Ivan Vert of Hauser and Vert, did I pronounce that nicely? Mm -hmm. Said to me, he asked me during the trust month, he said, can you explain your stupid country to me? Yeah. Which I did quite well, I was proud of it. And he then said, well, Switzerland, some mad idea of Napoleon. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> I had something prepared here, but it's really not going to work. Um, I, no, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I don't think I'm going to go, go on the Swiss um, thing. What I can say is that Richard is partly responsible for the project that the pictures are showing there. So, uh, as Jesus said, when I started working at ETH in Zurich, I was really um, kind of shocked by the scale of, um, the, um, of the school, of all the studios. I was used to UK schools, which maybe many of you have been through here, where studio or unit might be anywhere between 15 and 25 people, so quite intimate, very easy just through conversation to establish a sense of the studio culture, the community, and then suddenly I arrived there, and I was told that I had, there were 48 students in my studio, and in an elective there were 300. I was like, okay, now I have no idea how to handle these numbers. So we started building things, like building small buildings, um, mainly out of reclaimed materials. It wasn't called circular economy at the time. But anyway, making these very quick buildings in which people would get to know each other very quickly, would collaborate, and would probably do all these things which are really important to learn, but very dull to teach. So they happened kind of naturally. And they got bigger and bigger. Eventually, we did one on Lake Zurich, which was a huge floating pavilion for Manifesta. And in the end, I thought, that's as far as it can go. That's as big as it can go. It's as complex as it can go. It's getting dangerous. Um, and then at, during a talk that Richard was giving at ETH, slightly provocative, asked two provocative questions to the audience, maybe two, three hundred people. One of them was, how many of you have chosen your own clothes? Yeah. Which was <laughs> a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> the other question, which was more relevant to this, um, was how many people have dug a hole? And that was a really interesting question, not so much because of the numbers of people who put their hands up, which was fairly small, it was the discomfort that it produced in the room that suddenly everybody was a bit like, well, what's a hole and how big is a hole? <laughs> and, um, you know, it's like, how big is a mountain? It's, it, you know, so it was, and suddenly you realize that there was a whole experience of the world that was somehow missing from the curriculum, from the way that we um, learn and teach about architecture, that nobody knew anything about the ground when it's the only thing that is more or less certain to happen to architecture is hit the ground, is be in the ground. And then from there, basically, I asked ETH if I could have a piece of land in which we'd make a garden, or they would make a garden, they would design it, they would plant it, and then every cycle of students has to take over the garden from the previous. The maintenance forms part of the um, part, for part of the project, and there are a few rules, but one of them is that they, every generation of students can add something to the garden, but they cannot destroy anything that happened before. So there is this sort of duty of care over what happened before, and then now the thing is about um, six, seven years old, and it's becoming completely, uh, going a little bit out of control. Um, but nevertheless, it has kind of introduced into the kind of architectural space, maybe, you know, at a kind of quite a, at a quite a direct and maybe not particularly scholarly level, many of the themes that, you know, decay, um, rotting, um, pruning well or badly, um, and um, all, you know, uh, we, have a bird of, we have a bird of prey now who lives there, which is sort of, you know, not planned, but it's kind of there, and um, is sort of part of the, part of the community.
But then, really, finally, since we've been doing this, suddenly I, I went to renew the, sort of the lease, I suppose, of the land from ETH, and they turned around and said, no, this is about a year ago. And I thought, oh, that wasn't part of the plan. Um, a garden is supposed to, you know, uh, go on and on. It's all about the passage of time, things you can't simulate in a, in a kind of, in an academic calendar. And it's because they're, they're installing a ground source heat system across the whole campus, very, very deep piles to go carbon zero. So, of course, you're not going to stand in the way of that, which is a, a progressive and sensible thing to do. But they said you could have another piece of land where we've already done the ground source heat pumps. It's just down the hill. So we're now moving the garden. So the one that was installed over the last six, seven years. So transplanting it, so going through the whole process of cutting root balls, bring it out, rearranging it in a new arrangement, and that that is going to then um, set up a whole series of new conditions. We're working with an ecologist called Tom Crowther, who's an expert on um, below ground ecologies, mycelia and, and forestry. And um, yeah, let's see. I, you know, let's see if it survives. It's. I think it's next six months. Most of it will move. Fantastic. That's it. Yeah.